Hello and welcome to On Geopolitics, this podcast from the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge with Professor Ali Ansari and me, Suzanne Rain. We look at current geopolitical problems in a historical context and what could be a more historical context than the current ongoing tensions, I don't want to say war, Ali, but we might say war between Israel and Iran. Ali, helpfully for this conversation, is an expert on Iran, so it would be completely ridiculous not for us to have a conversation about this. And Ali, since we last spoke, quite a lot has happened. There's been a lot happening, hasn't there? Probably far too much. And it's always a salutary lesson, actually, that whatever you think might happen, sometimes things catch you by surprise in a sense as to how things particularly develop. And sometimes not all things are as explicable as you would like them to be, I suppose. That's the issue. Okay, Ali. So in the last couple of weeks, what has surprised you and what hasn't? Well, I mean, what has surprised me is the fact that the Iranians finally put their heads above the parapet. I mean, I thought that was quite striking. We all thought that after the attack on the ILGC in Damascus, and it was quite an attack, I have to say, it knocked out a fairly substantial part of their command and control structure for Syria and Lebanon, that the Iranians were going to have to respond. But I think that the response was actually in some ways not simply to do with that attack in Damascus. It was also to do with the fact that many of their allies in the region, their sort of proxies, if you want to call them that, but their allies, certainly the Houthis and the Hamas and others, were complaining rather loudly at some stage that they weren't actually doing anything on this whole war in Gaza. And that, you know, they were, as some people said, fighting to the last Arab. So it wasn't something that was going down very well. And there was a lot of taunting going on. And I think we have to add to that, that there's a sort of a new political grouping in Iran, certainly after the last election. I think we may have mentioned this in the previous podcast. When we say election, of course, it was more of a selection rather than an election. Very poor turnout, but more extremist hardliners beat hardliners, if we can put it that way. And there's a sort of a, a younger, revolutionary, zealous sort of group that have now come into more prominent positions. I think these things are all relative, by the way, but nonetheless, you know, there is, there is a case to be made that there is a group of people, there's a lot of pressure in Iran among what we might term, you know, the old school hardliners, basically saying that you're not doing enough. And what's interesting about this, I'll just put a bit of context into this. Several years ago, there was a um, wonderful television debate with Ali Shamkhani, who was then, I think, national security advisor for uh, possibly for the Rouhani administration. Uh, but it was many, many years ago before the, uh, I think, during the um, second Rouhani uh, election term. And some young guy was complaining to Shamkhani that the whole Iran-Iraq war had been badly handled and basically articulated a sort of a thesis that the Iranians were stabbed in the back. I mean, this was, this was very interesting, basically, that we could have won the Iran-Iraq war. It's just that people, weak-willed and useless people, had misled Imam Khomeini, so on and so forth. And we ended up uh, effectively, if not losing, certainly not winning the war. And we really need to complete this unfinished business. I mean, it was a very striking sort of debate. And of course, Shamkhani, as the old school guy, said, no, you weren't there. You have no idea what was going on. And don't be fanciful. So there is this argument, there's a whole generation of Iranians who sort of younger, zealous, revolutionary Iranians, who having missed out on the war in the 1980s, sort of feel they could have done a better job. And so there's a view that some of these are now influencing the way in which the supreme leader thinks. And because he's old and you know he's getting on a bit and whatever, and he doesn't have quite the grip that he used to have, he was sort of persuaded now that some sort of response had to take place. And the response had to be impressive. You know, We had to do it in a big way, an impressive way, a sort of a performative way. So that bit, I think, surprised quite a few of us, really, until the last minute. I mean, I remember being, um, I was having a discussion with a colleague and he said, no, no, it looks like there's something in the air. And I even thought, well, you know, it'd be interesting to see what they do. Because, you know, for me, the idea that you'd launch sort of 300 projectiles of one sort or another into Israel struck me as completely reckless. I mean, it was like, you know, what the hell would the response be? Ali, can I interrupt you just yeah. because, because you're, there's a whole load of things that you've said yeah. and I've got sub-questions for most of them. And at the same time, I don't want to interrupt your flow because it's brilliant. But something you said quite early on was there was a lot of taunting going on. Yes. And so it would be helpful if we could understand who was doing the taunting. And I, I mean, I know that there was in the Arab world there was taunting of Hezbollah as well, saying you, know, you, was, just, yeah. you, know, you just there come was. out and you say all these things and then when you are asked to defend the Palestinians, what do you actually do? The answer yeah. is nothing. So do you mean a general kind of hubbub in the Arab world saying, 
come on, Iran, come on, Hezbollah, you know, put your money where your mouth is or de- or shut up. Is that what you mean by there was a lot of taunting? I mean, I think that there was a general one, but there was also very specific comments that were coming out of Hamas and the Houthis and the Houthis in particular. The Houthis were doing the stuff in the Red Sea, obviously getting involved. And they were sort of saying, you know, where the hell are you guys? You know, what are you doing? So I think you're right on both points. There was on one level, there was a general sort of murmuring on the Arab street. And of course, support on the Arab street is very important for the regime, even though it doesn't have support on its own street, by the way, but it has support on the Arab street. And so they felt there had to be some sort of response in order to show that they were willing. You know, and that's why if you listen, Khamenei said very early on, he said, we will be doing the response. This will be, you know, our people will do the response. It won't be, you know, one of the proxies. They wanted to make it very clear that, you know, Iran was going to step up to the plate. And of course, then the question mark for all of us was, well, what the hell are they going to do? Because, you know, here you're dealing with an Israeli government who actually in some ways would quite relish moving the focus of the current conflict in Gaza towards Iran. I mean, so in that sense, you know, what are you doing? Are you actually because I suspect that the provocation in some ways also came from Israel. I mean, I know the Israelis then said, oh, we completely miscalculated what we did. But, you know, I, I sort of think there were some people saying, well, if the Iranians take the bait, they take the bait. And in some ways, you know, I was wondering, would they? And certainly they had to do something, but what would they do that would also, you know, as people were saying, the Goldilocks solution would also not escalate, you know, yeah. because obviously the Iranians... You know, at the end of the day, and one thing we do know is the Iranians are very, very anxious and acutely aware that they don't want to get into a full-blown conventional war for various reasons. Uh, a principal one being that their domestic situation is not particularly good, so it would undoubtedly destabilize them. So they're not feeling in a confident way. So what I found interesting about this whole situation is there's all sorts of parts of the sort of equation, the dynamic that are pulling in different directions. And, you know, the question mark was, how do you pull this off without, you know, making things considerably worse? So what I think was really interesting about what you just said was that the the taunters in chief or the taunters who mattered yeah. for Iran are Hamas and the Houthis, because what they're saying to Iran is, look, you, you've told us for a very long time that we're at war with Israel, we're at war with the West, whatever That's it right. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you've equipped us and you've trained us, and we're brilliant. So look what we've done. Uh, we, you know, <laughs> we've closed the Babel Mandav. We've done this hideous terrorist attack, and so Iran, you know, so so come on. And and then uh, to me, there's something really interesting that is less about a dialogue between Iran and Israel, but about the relationship between Iran and its long-standing proxies of who's actually going to do the fighting. And is that something that is more likely to be driving Iranian consideration? It's like, actually, you know, how do we continue to be credible with these mm. groups that we have supported for so long or not? I, I, I think so. I mean, I think, it had, I think the response had more to do with filling a credibility gap that was emerging rather than specifically the attack. I mean, I think the attack in Damascus was pretty shocking for them. I mean, I think pretty shocking for them for a number of different reasons, by the way. It's not yeah. just simply the scale of the casualties in that sense. Or the well, quality. in itself, it crossed a threshold, didn't it? Because it, going out so obviously attacking uh, diplomatic premises is something that is just not really on. No, no, to, absolutely. You know, I mean, the, the, the thing is, I mean, there are, I have to say, the, there is some debate about whether that was specifically a diplomatic premise, by the way. But yeah. let's assume it is. Uh, the thing is, of course, what it did, it also exposed a certain amount of Iranian hypocrisy about that because they, they have quite a good record of attacking diplomatic premises at one stage or another. So, But this was, I mean, it was quite a bold and, and bland attack in that sense. But I think the key anxiety that a lot of people didn't pick up on was how the Israelis knew that these individuals were there at that particular time and were able to do such a persistent strike. And of course, that's a question that hasn't really been explored enough. But in, in the initial aftermath, there were some question marks about uh, I mean, were the Iranians being very complacent about their security? That's possible. Because, I mean, we saw that with Hassan Soleimani as well, who basically obviously didn't hide you know, where he was going to be. But at the same time, there was increasing anxiety that someone had leaked information from within. And we have had some indication that certainly some, I think there were some Syrian voices that said that perhaps they had leaked information of where these people were and when. So that's also a problem. I mean, that's, that, I, I think that leads to this whole idea of the credibility gap, you know, that the challenge was twofold in that sense. It was not only the Israeli attack, but it was also the fact that they felt that some of their, potentially their allies, were actually leaking information about them. 
So they can't keep their operations secure. They can't exactly. keep their people safe, even what in what they consider to be safe territory. Home, ter home territory, yeah. basically, yeah. So this is why the response is, in a sense, required. But then, as I said, the next stage is what sort of response? I mean, what do you do? And I would have thought, and, and again, I mean, this is something that others who know about the sort of missile technology and stuff much better than I do, but, you know, the perfect response, in a sense, would have been, I think, a precision attack by the Iranians on some Israeli military target or something, which would have been very focused and very determined. Instead, what they did is they went for a sort of a, I don't know, a swarm attack of some sort, which I remember at the time, I mean, I don't know how you felt when you heard the news, but I remember lying there in bed and thinking, and they said, oh my God, you know, the Iranians have launched their drones. And I thought, oh goodness, you know, they're actually doing it. You know, they're doing something, an attack on actually on Israel. And then the next statement was at 120 kilometers an hour, it will take these drones six hours or eight hours to get there. And I, I must admit, it just gave me pause for thought for a moment. It's not exactly a surprise attack, is it? So even if it wasn't telegraphed, I mean, in a sense, it was, if I can put it that way. I mean, you know, it, it, it was a very odd way. And I, I always say to people, we ought to not always assume, because we always do it, obviously. I mean, there's two things we do with our opponents. One is we always tend to err on the side of, you know, you know, it's a bit like the missile gap with, you know, the Soviets and stuff. We always think they're maybe slightly better. You know, we believe some of the cut of their jib, so to speak, as they sort of, that's one thing. But the other thing is also this idea that, you know, actually their strategy or their, or their, or they have a strategy or their sort of military thinking is actually quite sophisticated in some ways, or they haven't misunderstood. I mean, I think, you know, the problem is these drones have been quite effective on the Ukraine, Russian, you know, border and the frontier. But of course, you're just popping them over the border. I mean, the front line is there and it has an effect. When, as someone said to me, it's like everyone forgot that Jordan exists. You know, it's, it's, it's like this idea that, hang on a minute, this is quite a long way for them to traverse. So again, I, I have this sort of question mark about, you know, what the point of all this was and how they did it. And I sort of understand there were two impressions given. One was that, you know, you had this thing that this was very, very performative. It was prearranged. Everyone sort of understood and so on and so forth. But the nagging doubt I have about that is simply that that really depends on the Israelis and your sort of blood enemies playing ball with you. I mean, you know, basically doing what is necessary and shooting all these down or, you know, everything working to plan or whatever. That's one thing. The other thing, of course, that always had a nagging doubt was the way in which the Iranians presented this attack at home in their domestic sort of networks and television, whatever, was pretty horrendous. I mean, they, they weren't hiding, you know, this wasn't a performative thing at all as far as they were concerned. They were actually doing some serious damage and they had lots of fake film, one of which was actually, interestingly enough, uh, people at a music concert, but running, but this was actually used to show citizens of Tel Aviv running for their lives, for instance. So, you know, the, there's that dual narrative. And I did talk to someone, they said it's not obviously impossible for the regime to produce those. You know, they've got one narrative for the audience at home and one narrative for the audience abroad. That's absolutely fine. But it sort of assumes that nobody at home is going to pick up any of the information abroad. Do you see what I mean? I mean, it, it's, it's just a bit odd to me. I mean, they, people aren't that stupid. They can see what's going on. So the narrative for the domestic audience was, we've done this big attack on Israel that has caused a lot of damage on Israel. Is that Yes, is that what I mean, that's the, what they... So the narrative has obviously been modified as they as they had to go through because they realised they can't make it. So the first narrative was, we've done quite a lot of damage. People are running for their lives. They even put footage of what they consider to be, quote, settlers at the airport, you know, getting ready to return to America or whatever it was. You know, it was a pretty dramatic attack. And, and at the same time, I think I, you know, I mentioned this, you know, the IRGC issued three rapidly re-edited pronouncements of the attack as it was going on, basically announcing successful hits before the missiles had actually got there. I mean, so there was already a pre-prepared script is what I'm saying. You know, they'd sort of said, we've done it, you know, it's done. Then they sort of slightly modified that by saying that actually, and, and this was is really the sort of the image that came through Harmonay's subsequent speech, that, it, you know, it wasn't really, the importance was not hitting anything. The importance was actually sort of taking part and doing something and showing they could do it. And then they said, of course, other people said that the whole strategy there was purely to reveal Israeli defences, and they've obviously kept all their superior weaponry behind. Now, that's something that other people can discuss. I don't know. I'm not inclined to think that that... I, I think that's all spin, my view, but other people will be in a better position to say, is that the strategy? The strategy was simply to see what the Israeli defences were like, so that later on they can do something more serious? I mean, my own view is that I think that's bluff and spin, but 
There you are. Is the reason that this is a bit confused the fact that it's really difficult to do battle damage assessment, so whatever the, yeah. the phrase is. So essentially you fire missiles at someone else and you have to then wait and see whether you've hit the target, what that's kind right. of damage it's done. I mean, that's always been a difficulty. And and we assume you know, America can't do that very yeah, well. I mean, it, sometimes America will fire a missile at something and they'll say, we completely hit the target. And then 48 hours later, they'll say, oh, no, we didn't. We hit the house next door or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, it's a very imperfect science because it requires you to have satellite coverage of your target, to have the That's analysts right. who are looking yeah. at it. And if you're firing 300 projectiles, which is a variation of drones and missiles, working out quickly what's happened to them all. And I, I mean, I'm not technical on this, but I'm assuming that working out what's happened to you know, 100 little drones yeah. isn't straightforward if they've been shot down over Georgian or somewhere. So it's not impossible that the confused messaging that you're getting, certainly over the first couple of days, is due to the fact that they're not entirely sure what the overall result looks like, that they're still trying to piece that together, while also, because, and this is just my hypothesis, mm. I'm using shoot it down, but while also in a military command structure or in a civilian command structure where obviously truth to power isn't straightforward. So saying, oh, by the way, they've all been shot down, isn't a message that's easy to pass on. That's right, yeah. But also you, you probably don't know straight away what's happened to them all. So that kind of adjusting of messaging as it's going on may be to do with a mixture of genuinely it taking some time to understand what the actual results has been, mm. but also taking some time to work out what the message you're going to pass to your superiors is. And then, you know, you just think about, you know, even a really efficient government's comms system yeah, sure. is not great. I wrote something recently, Ali, about the difficulty of understanding one's adversary. And That's I right, think, yeah. you know, we're in a situation where the real risk is that the level of understanding of the other has really collapsed because exactly as you said, we're assuming a degree of capability and perfection in the other, which we would never be able to replicate ourselves. And then we're interpreting on that basis rather than on the basis of them being a muddled, confused, you yeah. know, fairly effective military with a fairly effective command and control structure and a fairly effective comm system, all of which means that there might be failures on I mean there'll be frictions, right? There. I mean there'll be frictions. I mean I think I think that point's absolutely right, except for the fact I mean the one sort of anomaly in the, in that sort of thing is that the speed with which they came out with their results. So they were basically coming out with the results before the missiles had landed, which is sort of like, you know, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. And I think both in some ways are right. One is that clearly it's pre-scripted and they have a performative sort of element for overseas. But I think you're spot on also by saying that they were also with an eye on what they're going to say to the boss, you know, oh, we've been very successful. Now, what's interesting about Harmonet's response a few days later, of course, is he's obviously seems to have been alerted to the fact that actually nothing or very little got down. I mean, some of the stuff got down to the Israeli air base, as we know, whatever. And we don't know precisely what the damage was there. But I mean, of 300 and whatever it was, I can't remember, 310 or something or whatever it was, seven missiles got through, which is, I mean, you know, is interesting. I mean, the thing is how guided these were, I, I don't know. The other part of it, which is also quite interesting, of course, is the Israeli counter-strike. Again, the Iranian response to that was almost immediate. So, you know, they first of all, they diminished it and said, oh, this is nothing but quadcopters. The Israelis have sent toys against us or something. And then, you know, they, they had this and it went viral, I think, on Iranians. So they sort of passed on to this presenter in Isfahan, almost immediately stood in front of, you know, the main square in Isfahan and said, look, it's a beautiful day here and Absolutely nothing's happened and everything's marvellous and all this. And everyone said, you know, what? <laughs> you know, obviously they hadn't targeted the main square in Isfahan. It was obviously a base further out. But, you know, he was absolutely straight on. And, you know, it's good. It's, it's good information management domestically, you know, but it was so quick that saying, you know, nothing to see here, not a problem, all this. You know, nobody had done the assessment. As you say, of course, I mean, one of the things that the Israelis and the Americans and others, of course, have is they have more, sat you know, we have satellite capability, which the Iranians don't. So they were then able to look at the satellite pictures of what was going on in Isfahan. And two things become increasingly apparent. I mean, over several days, it took, as you say, several days, nearly a week for us to sort of basically get some sort of basic assessment. 
One was that some of the projectiles or some of the drone or something had obviously been launched from within Iran, which was sort of slightly worrying. Okay, I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm not sure whether it was from within Iran or just the border areas, Kurdistan, some of it, you know, but it, it seemed a little bit, mm, you know, what was the, the distance they could travel? But the other thing was that they clearly had knocked out the air defense systems around the nuclear facilities there, and it was a fairly strong signal, those S-300 that the Russians had given them. And that's also quite interesting because, of course, the Iranians have been arguing for some time with the Russians that they should be given S-400. Well, and the Russians, I, was, I had always been under the impression that the Russians had given them the S-400, or so, but clearly they hadn't. And of course, the S-300 isn't capable of really putting up much of a defense against uh, what the Israelis could put. And I, I think, again, you know, others will know better, but the assumption is that it was an air-launched missile with an Israeli plane that had not actually entered Iranian airspace, but had fired from the border somewhere. So again, that also indicates, and this is another point, by the way, that we need to raise, that the Israelis had basically flown right over Jordan and, and Iraq, you know, uh, or Syria. No, I mean, I don't know, but, you know, somewhere across, obviously, and got to the Iranian border. With, and it also, you know, reminds us that in the defense of Israel, we had clearly the Jordanians and I suspect, and I think it's fairly clear, the Saudis had also played some sort of role. And certainly the information that was given by a number of Arab states to the Israelis and the Americans were able to protect that. So as much as the Iranians were able to fill a certain credibility gap, I think there were a number of potholes along the way for them. One was that the Arab states tended, key Arab states actually, whether by default or deliberately by default, I mean, the Jordanian argument was, I think quite rightly, by the way, we're not just going to sit around watching drones coming across our airspace. I mean, obviously, we're going to do something about it, whether it's Israel or not. So that was one thing. You know, the, there was this sort of Arab uh, alliance, in a sense, or the Arab support for Israel became quite clear. The other thing is, of course, is that it did divert attention away from Gaza. I mean, it, it sort of played into that thing of broadening out this sort of conflict. Now, that's sort of subsided now. So perhaps they've, they've managed to, you know, obviously, we're going back in, you know, the Netanyahu government's you know, lost that, in a sense, uh, that momentum. But the other side of it, of course, is that there is a lot of mockery on Arab social media and other things of the fact that the Iranians didn't actually hit much. And for all the bombast, there wasn't a huge amount going on, and they found it all a bit, you know. So it, it's interesting to know how much of that credibility gap has been uh, filled. Uh, and I suspect it's it's much more debatable than, I, than obviously the way the Iranians want to present it, that some Arabs are sort of saying this, this wasn't actually as impressive as we thought it would be. And, you know, if you believe, for instance, that 50% of the missiles actually never launched or fell short, I mean, quite a few fell in Iraq. And there's also some evidence that some of the missiles were launched without warheads. I mean, basically just to launch something. Again, I think people will have to make an assessment of this in the long term, and there will need to be a proper military assessment. But these are things that sort of suggest that the Iranian missile um, force is not as necessarily as sophisticated as, as people think it is, that they have a lot of very good, cheap drones, which are very effective on a front line, sort of like suicide drones that can do this sort of stuff. But in terms of long distance strategic, you know, missile, it's not really there yet. And, you know, there was one incident on the evening, which I, I, I sadly can't find it because I think they've deleted it for obvious reasons, where one of the Iranian news agencies sort of bragged about and said, oh, we've hit Hebron. And I sort of said to someone, I said, isn't Hebron in the West Bank? I mean, you know, you did sort of think for a moment, crikey, what if some of this stuff had hit Palestinian, you know, all we need is for one of them to hit, to hit Gaza. I mean, it, it just would have been a fiasco. Uh, but it, it just sort of lets you think that how precise is this equipment? Now, others will be able to answer that, to be honest. I'm not going to make a statement. And if you go on the sort of rather jingoistic, I have to say, Iranian uh, some of the pro-regime, you know, it's very jingoistic. It's quite unpleasant, to be honest, but the, it's remarkable. You know, they all think that, you know, this is a marvellous show of power and, you know, the Iranians have all their sophisticated equipment waiting in reserve and so on and so forth. I mean, who knows? Okay, Ali, I've got another question. Sure. So if it was within the kind of governing part of Iran, however, mm. that, you know, the military and the sort of chemical leadership and all that. So even if it wasn't disappointing for them some way, it will have been disappointing for an element of them. And I was really interested in what you said at the beginning about a group of younger revolutionary yeah, yeah, yeah. zealots who said, you know, you're not doing the revolution well enough. Yeah. And I hadn't realized that they exist because one of the one of the beefs that I have about Western media is that it tends 
mostly to cover, often uncritically and often in a way that amplifies the strength of the opposition in yeah. authoritarian states. So you see people burning their headscarves, but you don't see the equivalent amount of coverage of an increasing number of younger revolutionary zealots of the new generation. And that's what, of course, we're noticing ac across the world. You know, there's sort of a whole load of different forms of more radical, more impatient mm. versions of an earlier thing. So they're kind of I mean, I did something recently on IS Khorasan and said you know, the reason that they're attracting young people away from the Taliban is because they've got the get your have done message. So what you've suggested to me is that there is a younger generation who says, not we're tired, the revolution was yesterday's war, uh, we just want to burn our headscarves and live a lovely Western life, but actually we're impatient because mm. the revolution hasn't been fulfilled. The yeah. reason, you know, the reason we've got all these problems is, is not because it was a failed idea, but that but that it's not been implemented we didn't do it vigorously properly. enough. Yeah. We didn't do we it properly. Do it properly. Yeah. So I hadn't been aware that that group of people existed because the coverage, the media coverage that we mostly get focuses almost overwhelmingly on the opposite because it tells us the story we want to hear rather than yeah. the story that we might need to hear. And and so is it possible that the effect of this not very effective strike on Israel might be that there's a group of people in Iran who start to say that wasn't good enough. Next time we're going to do it better. Well, I mean, so let me caveat some of those things. There. I mean, I think there, there is this group. The question mark is really whether they're uh, powerful enough and large enough actually to make a significant difference. And, and I'm a little dubious actually on, on the extent of them. I mean, clearly the regime has its loyalists and it's being pushed and pulled from different directions. Uh, what you may call a more pragmatic, I mean, what they're basically the younger ones say is they say, you know, you older people, you've all made a lot of money. You're all living it rather well. You've become decadent. What we need is a bit of new blood. And of course, Harmonay in a sort of a very Maoist cultural revolution type of way is sort of encouraging this type of stuff. The question mark is really is whether this has a wider impact. So when you look at the opposition and let's look at the whole business about putting the morality police back on the streets in a very vicious way, I have to say, I mean, a much more vicious way. So people are saying that this is uh, Harmonay playing to his base, consolidating his base, answering their need for extra pressure. And that's all well and good. I think that's absolutely right. But what's the reaction to this been? I mean, the, re the reaction to this has been pretty bad. I mean, it, what's been very interesting is that all sorts of range of people, including some clerics, have said that the way that they're treating women on the streets is appalling. And, you know, we cannot go on like this. And it's very clear that the whole hijab business has not been solved. In fact, someone came out with a wonderful statistical, in a sense, analysis, since people like these statistics. He said, you know, the morality police amount to maybe, you know, 15 to 20,000 of, uh, of, of, of the main police force. If you consider that 15% of adult women are not wearing the veil, that's about 5 million women. Uh, how how are these morality police going to be doing this? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be provoking a lot of people into a very, very bad reaction. And this is why, in a sense, I wouldn't, wh while these people exist and are, are certainly pushing the dynamics uh, and, and the political tempo, in a sense, among the elite, I don't think you can automatically assume that this is consolidating or stabilizing the regime. It might do actually the exact reverse because you're getting a whole host of people who want to go further and are just driving the state and the state machinery even further away from the bulk of the population who just really have no interest in this at all. And, you know, one of the people for whom the credibility gap has not closed at all have been domestic Iranians who find the whole thing absurd. I mean, there was an Iranian volleyball player, a woman, who put on Instagram, um, I feel I'm ashamed about this attack. You know, I don't think we should be attacking Israel. Of course, they, the first thing they did was arrest her. And this was the thing they said. I mean, it was very striking. On the night of the attacks, the IRGC put out a statement that said, if anyone, if anyone puts out anything criticizing the attack or supporting Israel, they'll be arrested. So on one, on one level, you could say, well, that shows great strength of purpose and whatever. On the other hand, it sort of tells you that lots of people are going on social media and saying that this is, this is a disaster and what are we doing and why. And you talk to people, you know, when they have had box pops in Iran, uh, I think Channel 4 went out recently and whatever, and people saying that, you know, we're not interested in war. We don't want war with Israel. You know, wh why are people dragging us? So I think there is this tension and, I, and I, you're quite right, but I don't think people pay enough attention to the sort of the, the radicalization of, the, of certain elements of the youth. 
But I don't necessarily think this makes the, the situation in Iran you know, any more safe for the regime itself. It, it knows where its base is and it's consolidating it. It's trying to its base. But in the process, about 75% of the population are getting more and more distant from what the regime is doing. So it's really interesting, Ali, because it, as you have of, often said, and I completely agree with it, you know, the, unless you're reading the Iranian media, unless yeah. you're talking to Iranian people, it's really hard to get a proper understanding of of what that balance mm. is. And I was, you know, I mean, if you, if you just do a little calculation and say fifteen percent of women are not adhering to the hijab rules, that still means eighty five percent of them are. Yeah. And the, then the question is, why? Is it because they choose to, or is it because they're afraid? And you can argue that for most people, you'd be afraid. But then there's also, and you, you, you will have the figures or the, the information more than I do, but there's something really deep about the number of people who are employed by the government in Iran, isn't it? So, so when you're looking at the besiege on the streets or all this, you know, there's, it, it, there's a very, very high percentage in relative terms of the population have some kind of state employment. Which binds people into? Are you, are you looking at me like you don't know what the figures are? No, no, I do. I mean, you're right. I mean, they, they say it's about forty percent uh, in yeah. terms of so. So there is there. I mean, again, here's the question mark. And you're quite right to say, and it is one of the arguments for the sort of resilience of the state is basically they have a, a sort of wide patronage networks. You know, they're they're using money to basically supply and bind people to them. The the problem with that argument is simply that. You know, the economic crisis facing the country means that they're not actually doing, you know, these coupons and subsidies and whatever are not actually delivering where what they should be doing. And many people are on strike, of course. And now, of course, the argument is they say, ah, but can they afford to go on strike? Uh, because, you know, they need to, to earn to make money. But the, the point is, if you haven't been paid your salary in six months, it doesn't really make a huge amount of difference. I mean, do, do, do you see what I mean? I mean, the, 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 I think the debate we have now about quote, authoritarian resilience or otherwise, and we've talked about this before, yeah. I think it's still far too one, possibly two-dimensional. I wouldn't even go further than that. I don't think pe people are still trying to fit evidence into the categories that they've invented for themselves. And in Iran, it's quite true that it's not like the period of the Shah where people were much wealthier and could afford to go on strike, so to speak. But the point is, is that now you've got into a situation where the state is not delivering on a whole host of things. It's not delivering the sort of the support other than a, a very close coterie. That's true. But, you know, one of the arguments for so many leaks in the security establishment is that people are selling secrets. And why are you selling secrets? <laughs> because you need the money. I mean, it's, it's very, very simple. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting that it's become very, very porous in this respect. So there is money. There's undoubtedly that. And I think there's a, a range. But, you know, one economist got up and he gave a very you know, a uh, bitter sort of speech about this. And he said, you know, we simply do not tax enough of this, of the state. There's so much. He said, we've just passed a tax law that says that all organizations under the supervision of the Supreme Leader are, are exempt from tax. And he says, but that's about 60 or 70% of the economy. So he said, how on earth are we meant to operate? You know, we're getting into a situation where the government is effectively going bankrupt and money is being squirreled away in these revolutionary organizations. But we have no idea what it is, where they do, where the money comes from. And clearly, this does provide a certain amount of support to their allies and stuff. But it's still a fact that inflation is rampant. People are facing a very, very, I wouldn't even call it a cost of living crisis because that's a bit fatuous to say that in comparison to what's going on here. When you've got inflation at 40 50% and the price of goods just rocketing up, it's it's proving very very difficult for people to um, provide a sort of a sustainable life for themselves. And I've talked about this too. I mean, what's interesting is you if you have these uh, various sources of information from younger working class sort of people in Iran, or whatever and they do, and it, you know the figures that are coming out are quite astonishing actually. How people are trying to make ends meet. So while they do retain, you know, I think it's fair enough to say that twenty five thirty percent of the population are in some ways tied to the regime. And one could say that's enough. I mean, that keeps them enough and they can keep, you know, as long as they keep loyal, um, they can keep the rest of the population suppressed. My sort of counter argument to that is that it's just not a very secure and stable way of doing it because at some stage, something might tip the balance. 
And this is the problem. And I think you can see that in their own sort of commentary, that you simply cannot proceed like this indefinitely. There has to be some sort of adjustment made to the way in which the state operates. But at the moment, we don't see any indication of it. That's the problem. Well, except that we did, there is going to be an adjustment soon. Well, when the Supreme Leader dies. Exactly. And so can we also read into this a jostling for position? Yes. So we've seen, I think, a strengthening of the Revolutionary Guard in economic terms, in 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 sort of military terms. Yeah, yeah. And as as being a sort of core element of the state, I don't know the identities of all the different people who might be, you know, the, the kingmakers behind the, yeah, the yeah. scenes. But presumably that's also a critical dynamic that is driving decision making. At the oh, no, absolutely. At the and I, 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 this is why I also think it's going to be a very turbulent time because all these different factions in the system are going to be competing for position. At the moment, the most likely contender for Ali Khamenei's crown is his son. Now, if you look at that, you have to imagine that a generation of people who believed, genuinely believed in the Islamic Republic have got to face the fact that basically what you're seeing is a hereditary system of monarchy effectively being restored. Maybe people will just absorb it and it'll all be fine, you know. But I suspect quite a lot of people will find it extremely troubling. And, you know, they will begin to wonder what all the sacrifices of the revolution have been for if all you're going to do is restore essentially a hereditary autocracy, whatever you want to call it, by the way. But, you know, I can already see, by the way, that certain regime loyalists are beginning to talk in this way. Oh, yes, this is a very normal way of how government works. And actually, in a, that's what I would say. I'd say absolutely right. You know, I mean, if you look in the context of Iranian history, autocracy is the norm. Of course it is. Uh, hereditary autocracy is the norm. But that was not the purpose of a revolution, which has cost so much in blood and you know money and the status of the, of the country. So I think it will cause a lot, lot more problems. And uh, the, the fundamental facts are these, I think, that if the regime was economically competent, let's say for the sake of argument in a Chinese model, I think there's no doubt that it could sustain itself for a very, very long time. I mean, I, I think there the argument for authoritarian resilience becomes pretty clear because it's delivering. It's delivering to its people in a very... But at the moment, it's not. I mean, it just isn't. And the IRGC, if they sort of basically take over and become the Praetorian Guard effectively to the new regime, are not well-renowned for economic management. So it's just going to make matters worse. And you can see this, for me, this deteriorating cycle. Now, whether it you know, it deteriorates quickly or slowly or whatever. I suspect it will be slowly, by the way, but you can see that deterioration taking place. You just, you just get the figures for brain drain, suicides, depression, whatever in Iran, and it doesn't paint a pretty picture. And it doesn't show that there's a, there's a healthy system in place. So, you know, there, there is a, I think there's a very, very good debate to be had on this. And I hope it would be done you know, my plea is that really it needs to be done on a much, much more serious basis than it has been. I'm not a great fan of the thesis of muddling on, let me put it that way, because I just think muddling on is, yes, okay. I mean, things can muddle on, but things will muddle on until they don't muddle on. And the, and the key is, as I've been trying to deliver in a couple of talks I've been giving recently, what we don't want to do is describe what we see. Anyone can describe what we see, even though what we see may not be what is actually going on. What is important as a historian, and I do think this is important, is to study the process of change and how things are moving, what direction they're moving in, and what are the possibilities of, you know, what are the possible outcomes of that? I think that's important. And I think, you know, part of our problem in the social sciences, if I may say so, and certainly some branches of international relations in the United States and political science with a capital S, is that it describes what we see. And uh, that's all well and good, but it doesn't tell you or I, or anyone involved in policy, What's going to happen in five years' time? Yeah. Three? Years. Do you see what I mean? I mean, and I think I completely that's the agree key. with you, Alex. That's the key. I completely. The really good analysis says not only what we see, but what we conclude from yeah, it, and therefore exactly. what we what we might expect to see next. Um, on that note, Ali, we're out of time. We are out so... of time. We are. <laughs> <laughs> but can I thank you? For no, thank you. Those really fabulous insights and. Uh, Clearly, this is an evolving it's situation. It's an evolving situation. Needless to say, the minute we wrap this up, something else will happen. So. <laughs> but I don't think you've said anything that commits you to one position or no. another. So that's yeah. terrific. And we'll keep talking about it, Ali, because I really value your great expertise on this. So thank you very much thank to you. you. And thank you to our listeners. And goodbye. Goodbye.